Okay, buddy. Um, hello, all, and welcome to the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. Today is March the 4th, Monday. Morning, Ethan. I am. Uh, this, event, this event is being recorded and will be available on the Hyperledger YouTube channel. We'll post that link on the, uh, it'll be on the wiki as well as we'll post it on the uh, LinkedIn uh, Hyperledger Media and Entertainment page. I am Brett Russell, chair of the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. And with us again today is our fabulous and very helpful chair assistant, Ms. Randy Givens. Good morning and welcome morning. to the Hyperledger Entertainment and Media Special Interest Group. Randy will provide links in the chat to the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, the Hyperledger Antitrust Policy, and she'll put in the uh, links to our LinkedIn page in the chat. So please uh, open those up and uh, bookmark them and join the page. Follow the LinkedIn page, uh, and uh, you'll be up to date, kept, kept up to date on everything that we're doing here. Yes, as you can see, the links are already posted. And um, you're welcome to click in and to join um, our community. Thanks, Randy. And Randy will also be monitoring the chat for any questions and comments that may come in. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Brett. And please leave any comments or questions um, in the chat. And thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Randy. So You're as welcome, I, I said earlier, we, we, uh, I am the chair of the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. And today we're going to move on to our second blockchain AI roundtable. Uh, we are short a few important members today uh, who had other important uh, commitments. Uh, Todd Holmes, who's the, uh, uh, Todd is the Associate Professor of Entertainment Media Management at California State University, Northridge. Uh, Jay Deverett, Jay Deverett, uh, Jay is the manager of Deloitte consulting blockchain and digital assets and based in Toronto. And we had some great contribution last week from our last meeting from Andy Rosen, who's the uh, technical innovator and troubleshooter. Andy is a founder of Sequence Key. Uh, uh, today, we have some very important people and uh, Orson Weems. Orson is the executive director of the Music Education Initiative and the nephew of the legendary Al Bell, founder of Stax Records, and past president of Motown Records Group. Ethan Cool. Ethan is a senior data specialist with Walmart, scientist, excuse me, with Walmart, and also works with us through the, uh, with uh, uh, Karen Kilroy through the nonprofit Friends of Justin. Karen Kilroy. Karen is our moderator and a CEO of File Baby, an author of a number of great books, Blockchain, Tethered AI, AI and the law, and blockchain as a service. I am Brett Russell, again, founder of Accuratius, which is a de we're developing blockchain in the entertainment industry. I'm also the chair of the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group and the organizer of this blockchain AI roundtable. Today, we have an agenda, a discussion agenda that's been put out to share amongst the members here in our group over the last week, two weeks, and uh, we've we've already had a lot some very interesting uh, discourse on this, and um, I, I'm uh, I'm excited that uh, that we got some fantastic feedback about the current efforts, and this is in specific to uh, to number number three. In fact. Um, I apologize. I, I, I'm going to put the agenda up here in the chat. And um, um, oh, I'm sorry. I could do it if you don't have it handy, Brett. I have, I have, it, right I have it right here. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I, actually, go ahead. Can you throw that up there? I apologize. I can. I got it. While Karen's doing that, I'll just run through the, the four items that uh, – we're slated, are slated for discussion today, and if they, the clock runs out, we're going to continue the discussion online at our next meeting, whenever that might be, and uh, any other way we uh, 
So the first agenda item is, should the entertainment industry create a category for any film, TV, music, streaming production that used AI during development industry benefit or detriment? I wish that Todd was here today because I think he'd be the first guy I'd hit that up with. Hey, Karen. Like he's the, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he definitely is the, uh, he's the go-to guy for that. The second item is uh, blockchain permission and public ledgers. We have time stamping. We can store data sets, rights, metadata, training data, content identifiers, digital fingerprinting, monetization, smart contracts. I mean, these are all things that, that AI is data and uh, this works. Blockchain works with AI. There's no doubt about it. Uh, standards groups and agencies should participate. What standards groups and agencies should participate in policymaking for the use of AI in the entertainment industry? Again, I know Karen has got a lot to say about this, and I know there's some groups out there that, that are involved, but uh, it's, it's big business right now. And the final one is training data that's used to produce new music, film and TV video, script writing, et cetera, should be protected, regulated, licensed. So there's a lot to chew on here. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think I don't want to use the numbering that we put in here and start off with uh, number three, the standards groups and agencies, and, and give the floor to Karen here, who's got a lot to say about this and uh, has a, 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 an absolute wealth of knowledge. So. Karen, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Brett. Um, as as Brett indicated, uh, we've been up to our eyeballs in uh, in content provenance and authenticity. And um, he also mentioned that I had written a book, Blockchain Tethered AI, uh, which uh, came out a year ago on Valentine's Day. And uh, it, it, Blockchain Tethered AI uh, was uh, the product of, of years of research, uh, about seven years of research went into that on how uh, AI could be made more trusted uh, with blockchain. Meanwhile, there are many other standards groups also work who had their eye on AI and other uh, fake media and trying to uh, figure out ways to prove authenticity there that were not uh, involving blockchain. And so there's really, really a lot of good ideas from what I would call that side of the house, right? It's almost like two different worlds for us because uh, you know, we've been in the blockchain world and uh, meanwhile, other people are coming from industry verticals and they're addressing these problems. So it was like, the, it's almost like the old uh, Reese's peanut butter commercial, uh, pe Reese's peanut butter cups. You know, I got my chocolate in your peanut butter. Oh, you got your peanut butter in my chocolate. <laughs> so that's kind of where we need to be right now. I think, you know, from the technical side of the house, especially, you know, the the enterprise blockchain side of the house, which is, you know, quite, uh, it's, you know, it's quite a thing in its own, in its own merit. You know, there's a lot there, a lot of, uh, a lot of the problems that the, the uh, industry vertical groups are bringing up as problems, we already have the answers for. So uh, there needs to be a lot of meaning of the minds. And, uh, and one of the uh, things that, we've been involved with. Uh, and on today's panel, um, we happen to have uh, Orson Weems, who is president of File Baby, and, and Ethan Keel, uh, who has helped me uh, come up with the idea for File Baby. And uh, he's a distinguished architect at File Baby. Uh, and um, what we have built is, is based on uh, a practical applications of standards that were built by a standards that were developed by the C2PA uh, standards group. And, uh, and so uh, C2PA stands for uh, content authenticity, or I'm sorry, coalition for content authenticity, uh, content provenance and authenticity. Someday I'll get that right. And then there's also another group uh, CAI, which is Content Authenticity Initiative, which is a broader group uh, that where people apply the technologies that are developed by the C2PA. 
And so since today's panelists uh, are, uh, since today's roundtable is Orson and Ethan primarily, um, I'd like to really dive into uh, this topic and, you know, into what is C2PA? What's interesting about it to us? Uh, why, how did we get into it and why? And I'd like to start with Orson. Uh, Orson, uh, can you tell us what uh, C2PA is? And why it's well, a standards. Yeah, it's a standards group because we, we need some type of a, a, a way for people to know that we're not just pulling rules or standards out of thin air and there's a support system behind that to make it very comfortable and for it to be something honorable for really uh, to have the the type of responsible responsibilities and regulations set. We can't just have things running amok out here with this and, and we need to have some standards set. And, and what we know is that uh, the, the major corporations and the uh, media companies that are joining uh, the C2PA, uh, from some of the majors that, that we're, we're, we're part of through Friends of Justin, a, a nonprofit that we're part of so that we could be involved, involved with that so that we can let people know that we're part of a standards group that really is interested in the responsible AI usage and the delivery of that AI so that people know that when we tell them that it's uh, something to authenticate and pr to provide that provenance, it needs to, to be backed up by something. And we have all of these, these organizations that are behind us. And it's, it's very important to know that trust is a big part of this because some people have seen some of the horror stories already as quickly as AI is moving and the uses of AI is moving. Uh, so I think that we need to have uh, this and it's important for groups like uh, the C2PA uh, for us to have these type of standards that we can go to and see uh, some of the violations that we're going to see coming out later on. And it's, it's important for us to do that. Yes. And, and um, e Ethan, uh, would you like to talk for a minute about how um, uh, we got started with C2PA? For sure. Yeah, that was a great explanation, Orson. Thank you. Um, so, uh, about, um, about this time last year, maybe a month, you no, know, it's been about 11 months, probably. Um, we were, I was at the Fayetteville library with Karen as she was doing a series of talks on, um, how do artists begin to integrate with generative AI and learn how to make money with it? How does it improve their creative process? Um, how does it improve the business side of their art? Um, and as we were going through this, uh, Karen was showing off um, Adobe's Firefly, which is an image generator. And I noticed that there was a little icon in the top, a little information icon whenever an image was generated. And lo and behold, that, that little icon was a C2PA icon. Um, and basically what it told us was, hey, this image was generated by AI through Adobe Firefly. And I thought that that was pretty revolutionary for a company to already be integrating AI um, tech, like uh, AI watermarking or AI manifest to let people know that this is uh, actually generated by you know AI. Um, and as we explored this more and got involved with C2PA, we joined C2PA in August. Um, the use cases really just started to, to blow up and, and we really began to realize the power of someone, human, AI, everything in between, that being able to claim and basically put your name on your work on the internet and be able to claim its fair use is going to be crucially important for the future of the economy and for, for humans in general. Um, we really need to be able to tell what was human made versus AI made, how it was made um, in order to really protect human rights in an age where Gener AI generated content is, is you know, proliferating. And we have to be able to uh, establish a value system between 
AI generated works and human generated works in order to protect uh, the ingenuity and the the humanness of work that we put online. And so um, that is really where it began and uh, and where file baby was was really born was with this conception of how do we enable people to put their name on their work and have it stored safely on the internet so people can see Jane Doe created this this ph photography uh, using you know a Nikon and then they also uh, use Adobe Firefly on top of that to to you know change some things in the background, generate some images in the background, things along those lines. Um, I think it's really a, uh, a crucially important thing to be able to distinguish for the future of the, of the human race. Yeah, it, it seems like this is coming on us. Um, it's almost faster than what we can comprehend. Uh, the, uh, the changes are, are almost daily. Uh, and, uh, you know, anybody can uh, feel free to jump in here. Um, but uh, like one of the things, like, for instance, you can't, you almost can't promise you can, you aren't going to use generative AI and everything because it's, it's like, um, you know, you think about the automation that's come upon us, you know, a simple version would be the calculator, right? The calculator made it so you don't need to, uh, you don't need to, to, to do all your math manually anymore. And there was a time when that was, people were aghast about that, right? They were just like shocked that, you know, why would you do something like that? That's cheating. You'll, you'll, you, you won't, you'll lose your skills. You'll never be able to figure anything out again. You'll be stupid. But here we are, you know, quite a few years later, and we realize that, you know, of course, we're going to use new tools as they come along. Human races is progressing really, really rapidly. And uh, one of the things um, that uh, I saw that is a case in point really for, I think it was a, kind of fits with your uh, number number one here uh, uh, is uh, the, that the BBC came out with a statement on how they're going to use generative AI. And this was just the other day. And uh, the BBC uh, did not say they're not using generative AI. They said they're going to be transparent about where they use generative AI. And, uh, and they, they, they released a really honorable statement, a very thorough, thorough statement that I hope becomes like a almost like a, 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 a paradigm for the industry that people start doing that and saying, you know, we're not going to be in denial, but what we're going to do is be transparent. And uh, BBC was one of the leaders uh, in developing C2PA and they still are very active. And, uh, and so uh, what that means is that they, well, they started five years ago uh, because they wanted to be able to prove when something was fake news or not. You know, they have a reporter that's been out there on the front lines. They've seen what actually happens and then they see what goes around on the internet. And so it's really, really critical to a news organization like the BBC to be able to get right back to the origin of that media and be able to track it down. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of been, uh, you know, what's happening. Um, so, let me go to uh, Ethan again. What what are your thoughts on on how the industry, on how industry? Karen, can I can I just ask a quick Larry, question of you? Uh, before, just yeah. going back to that, uh, sure. can, do you have a link to that BBC statement? Can you I put need that, to find it. You, I wasn't planning on it. No, so no, no, I no that's fine. It. But could you put that up in the uh, in the LinkedIn page? Yes. Not, not now, not uh, sometime today, tomorrow, whenever you find it. I think that's very, uh, uh, very interesting. And I think that, that if that's the start of this standards that we talk about, that uh, that's really valuable. I'd like to pursue further discussions and kind of follow that as part of our, as part of our group here. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead, Ethan. Sure. Um, so I think, Karen, what you were saying is how can industries begin to integrate C2PA into their daily workflows, um, if I was understanding your uh, question correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm okay. more like, uh, 
if if you're not the BBC, but you're another organization that's tasked mm. with how are we going to use generative AI? Mm. You know, what's a good way to start with your policies and 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 your mm. transparency? And uh, I just kind of wanted your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a that's a really it's a really great question. Um, so really i i feel like uh the more transparent we are the better and really that is to preserve the integrity of you know communication media everything um we've seen you know i read an article i think it was a week ago where it was like how the internet destroyed media in three decades, you know, something like that. Um, and while I don't know if that's fully true, I think that generative AI can really have a, a huge impact on what, what can we actually believe and what is the integrity of what we are communicating either to customers, to um, our coworkers, um, or just, you know, between businesses. Um, so for me, I, I really think that each company really needs, I think, and I think this is a revolution that's happening right now, where each company really has to take some time to think through their AI strategy and be willing to communicate openly about how they are using AI. Um, especially, especially generative large language models, forecasting things along those lines have been around for decades. Um, and I think, you know, the, while those models, you know, are, are also hugely important and there've been plenty of, of case studies of how forecasting can actually be, you know, very biased and, and harmful. There is a new paradigm with large language models and being able to actually understand the, the English language and how we communicate that we have to really be able to uh, um, explain how we are integrating this into our business practices. And this also goes for image generation and, and everything in between. And so I really, I really think that everyone's AI policy needs to start with a public declaration of this is how we use it. Um, and this is how we plan to track it to ensure that we're not building something that goes off the prescribed rails. Um, you know, there, there is a, a lot of worry about how AI can, you know, create a doomsday scenario. And while I think we are still a ways off from that, um, it is important to begin to think through the policies of, of how we actually want to keep AI within a regulatory box. Um, and how, and I think this is especially relevant to um, ensuring that humans are, are compensated fairly for work that they do, whether it be with an AI partner or whether it be completely by themselves. Um, that is really my, my biggest concern is the economic factor of how do we ensure that there is integrity and that a company isn't just going to, you know, rely fully on AI um, to, for its creative endeavors and for its communication style. Uh, because, if so, we, we really have to be prepared for how we are going to uh, ensure that everyone can get compensated outside of maybe a traditional job, um, whether that be creating content for AI to ingest, whatever that looks like. But there's a huge, I think it's a, it's a Pandora's box, honestly. Uh, there are so many questions and we're only gonna be able to answer maybe one a year um, if that, you know, uh, because it's it's moving so rapidly, I just think it's important for companies to to begin to think, 
how do we use this and how are we totally transparent about how we are using it to ensure that customers have um, good clarity into their business practices? Um, so long winded answer there. Um, yes, sir. Go ahead. No, no, sorry. I, I thought you were done. Keep, keep going. I'm, long, yeah, long winded no, answer. Good. Go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry about that. No, no. I was, uh, you know, TLDR. I, I, like I said, I think it's a PR, it's a Pandora's box. Uh, there is a lot of questions. The most important question in my mind is how do you communicate how you're using AI and how do you show AI work um, versus uh, human AI work versus purely human work? My, I my, wanted to ask Orson. Sorry, oh, sorry, Karen. I'm sorry, Brett. I wanted to ask Orson how that applies to the entertainment industry. Were you thinking the same thing? Uh, a lot, a lot. Because you know, a lot, as we know, and we've seen that uh, that as I've said in the, our very first SIG, is that this technology has taken and enhanced or taken and misused certain artists' works, and whether it's music, film, videos, or if it's lyrics, etc. So, but what's very interesting is what Ethan mentioned was the the icon that he saw on the Adobe Firefly uh, when we were looking at some of this and building some of the things that we built out. And what's very interesting is that the content authenticity initiative, and, and that would be uh, online content authenticity initiative.org. Uh, and we mentioned C2PA earlier and that's C2PA.org also. But what we know is that there that we like to have the content credentials. That's that uh, the part of that manifest that Ethan mentioned that puts the data in it behind this behind what people actually see. You can go in and actually see. I like to call it the the DNA of that of that particular person that owns that uh, content. And in the Content Authenticity Initiative, put out a uh, had a panel. Over, I think over in India, there were some people that were with some of the larger corporations then in the content authenticity initiative that was a part of that presentation where they wanted people wanted to know. And the part of the slide was what are content credentials? And, and if you will, there's some bullet points that's very interesting about what content credentials are. And content credentials are a, a new kind of metadata for images, audio, video, and they said streaming and live. So that's an incredible bullet point. Another one was context attached to content. Context attached to content. Again, very something that, that's really needed as we find out, as we've said, what's AI generated, what's human generated. And if it's human generated, how does that human generated piece get to the point where it can be utilized and not just used freely, all right? Uh, what content credentials are a vehicle for authentic storytelling through transparency? Again, authenticity and provenance is that we we, we talk about so much. Uh, another bullet point was a way for creators and companies to achieve attribution for the content they mm -hmm. produce. And that's very important also. Uh, another point was a foundation for consumers to make informed trust decisions. And finally, the other last bullet point that those part of this content authenticity, what are content credentials is, it's a tool for organizations to safeguard their brands. So I think that's very important for us to, as we move on this and as as we share this link and, and uh, this, uh, Brett, as we share this hyperledger uh, presentation that we have now that people really need to understand the, the impact that we're seeing. And we're talking about entertainment from the aspect of designers. We're talking about the different things that so many people are involved with that don't get mentioned as part of the music, media, and entertainment. So we've seen quite a bit of the things that we want to address and, and be helpful about it. And we need to be, as I see us doing right now, being proactive to make this happen so that it can help people. I, I think this is what we really need to look at in having the types of things that are available for people to get comfort because I don't think they need to be hesitant about 
AI. It's already here. It's already, and we know what it's capable of. So, and, and we need to be in that position to, to share the information that like we're doing right now and do it in, in trustworthy and, and putting out these wonderful presentations, you all. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Orson. Um, Brett, were you wanting to jump in? Is yeah, that I wanted, of, uh, yeah, and I apologize for cutting you off, Ethan. Uh, you use the word public, and you use the word, I mean, a lot that Orson and Ethan have just stated so eloquently comes around to trust, including identity. So my question to uh, the expert in the, the panel, or the, you're all experts, but specific to blockchain and pulling this all back towards our item number two, in conjunction with C2PA, Karen, Orson, and Ethan, where do you see blockchain and the capabilities of blockchain, in particular permissioned blockchain and its marriage to public blockchain, where do you see it fitting inside that and that's my question to you karen and to orson and to oh Ethan. yeah but karen this is a crucial component to our goals and our modus operandi to find that uh you, you know you talk you guys talk you ai experts talk about modeling you talk about uh uh all of the the necessity to 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 learn for ai to learn that information, should it be protected? Should it be documented? Should it be? So that I think, Karen, I think you, you got the gist of my question. How can we pull all of this back, this great information, that, the direction that C2PA is headed, the other groups that you guys have talked about, um, and including File Baby? Where, where do we pull all this back into blockchain, which can form that level of trust so that everything after that is, let's say, provable. So that's uh, that's my question, Karen. Thanks for the uh, the spot. Go ahead. We were thinking about doing that with Friends of Justin, starting a trust group and putting a, 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 on blockchain our own trust group. That's an AI trust group and putting it on blockchain and starting that off as an experiment. You know, to see how well the blockchain tooling fits the needs of an AI trust group. Uh, so uh, that's something that Ethan and Orson and I have been throwing around. Um, now to uh, answer the bigger question, um, blockchain is like a, uh, like a catch-all for all these groups and all these standards. So you can make one trackable traceable audit trail of how things have gone. Because if it ever comes to uh, trying to negotiate with someone for money or proving things in court, you know, what you really need is that trail of evidence. Here's what happened when we did this, we did this, we did this. Now, who knows whether whoever you're talking to is going to honor the things that you've done uh, in a in a court, they would generally honor some kind of evidence over no evidence. Uh, so it's a, a blockchain can help keep everything organized and also keep everyone involved that's supposed to be involved um, through through a trust network uh, and distributed nodes. Now um, that said, um, I will say that C2PA is blockchain ready. And it it almost likes walks almost all the way up to the blockchain, but doesn't do it. It it, it creates a, a fingerprint of the file to prove uh, that the file has not been tampered with, and so there's uh, so that's very similar to what we do when we put some put something on blockchain. We don't usually put the whole file on blockchain. We would take a, a hash of the blockchain and put the hash on blockchain. And so then uh, you can tell if the file's been tampered with based on the hash. So that immediately 
you can see it's exactly the same thing. You'd put those hashes on blockchain and, and then that would give you that extra layer of, of distributed nodes and chained blocks. I mean, let, that's what blockchain is, is chained blocks. And if you don't have blockchain, you don't have chained blocks. So that's, you know, a really important thing for making sure something hasn't been tampered with. Can I ask um, you one quick question, Karen? Like that sure. state, that statement, is this not just the perfect scenario, that statement by the BBC that they are going to commit to doing to transparency? Would that not be almost like the genesis block to a a commitment from them or a commitment network. Yeah. We, we commit to transparency. Here's our Genesis block. You can look back at that in 10 years and you can see our commitment to doing this. Noted, hashed, uh, up on IPFS, wherever, but there's the commitment to doing it. And, and knowing that that commitment is immutable, knowing that everybody in the world can see that commitment on the blockchain means that they can't change from that commitment. Sorry, that's. I just wanted to yeah. make that point about how powerful what you just said is. Tying that back to your BBC claim or the BBC article about the, the commitment to transparency. It's one thing to commit to yes. transparency. It's another thing to prove that you've committed to transparency. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, you can prove it. And it's an extra layer of proof. Um, I mean, you can, it's kind of like the, 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 it ties everything together. It's the glue that holds it all together is, is what blockchain should be in this scenario. And it's just going to take a while for the different standards bodies to realize that they need it. Um, the, um, the, the thing that's going to help that is um, there is now a marketplace of companies that specialize in blockchain and AI. And uh, it's sprung up over the last couple of years. Um, you know, we're right. It's exactly a great combination because you've got a technology that can go rogue that needs to be tracked and traced. And you've got something that can track and trace it. I mean, it's just, a, it's a perfect match. And so, so I think what you're going to see is as these standards come into play, C2PA is the most mature one and widely adopted that I know of, but there'll be others. And, and uh, there's going to be a whole marketplace that can say, we can put this on blockchain for you. All you need is this plugin. And it's gonna to start to become commonplace. Can I, can I just add, I, I, uh, C2PA sure. is uh, part of the uh, Linux Foundation, correct? Uh, no. No, they're not? No. No, uh, no, Linux, are they not, no, they're are not. They not. Okay, okay, sorry. No. I so thought they're, they were. They're, in, they're uh, they are a product of a, a group. You'd have to read the website to find exactly how it came about, but it's it's uh, news agencies and Adobe and Microsoft. Okay. Trying, and they started to they started around five years ago to uh, disprove fake news because the field reporters would go out and they they'd see exactly what was going on. And then they'd come back and say, why is everybody distributing this fake thing when I know that isn't what happened? And so they, they, it, it came out of a need for that. And then the AI was kind of like, you know, happy accident, uh, if you will, you know, it, we have something that can help track and trace the, uh, the rogue AI. So it just all kind of needs to come together. Um, so so I, I guess I'd pass that off to Orson. Uh, your thoughts on, on what blockchain brings to the table um, with uh, C2PA and FileBaby. You know, we talk about FileBaby. Oh, by the way, Orson is the president of FileBaby. Um, and uh, that is... Uh, the idea file baby was the idea that Ethan and I had to implement C2PA tooling because it was too hard. You had to be a programmer to do it. So yeah. Orson, would you like to talk about blockchain and, and C2PA and file baby for a yeah, second? What, what we've seen with using and utilizing uh, file baby, the, the way that file baby was set up and it's literally a, uh, a file management system for, to protect a creator's authentic 
creations, their original art, whether it's music, art, publishing, any type. And what we've looked at in some of the research, and you mentioned early on, Brett, that Karen uh, wrote the book AI and the Law. And our discussions also serve as a way to let enterprise groups, large groups, know that uh, a, an additional step for security, even beyond of what we have was set up with FileBaby for authenticity and provenance, is the blockchain connection to where we can really add another layer of security that uh, for comfort for these folks. Uh, we did a, uh, we've had a lot of contacts with this since the Munich Security Council meeting early last month uh, to know, uh, and one of the topics was again, election interference. And so with what Karen is discussing and Brett, what you know, and Ethan and all those that may know how the blockchain works is that we these are some of the things that can utilize the blockchain for the added security of what is authentic. Now, whether people want to, want to have their minds made up that what they have seen that's not authentic, uh, it's up to them. But the proof is, as with some of the attorneys we may have spoken to that see what we're, we're doing, they say, no, the provenance is the key the, and the authenticity. So blockchain adds that other layer of that. And when, once we understand, uh, or not what we understand, but once the, the consumer or someone that would subscribe or purchase or allow us to build the platform that they need, for uh, us to implement these type of procedures, the blockchain uh, part of the of the uh, of what we have are discussing today, I'm telling you, it's very critical that we have this in place so that people really can go back and say, no, on this particular day and time, at whatever it was, this is the original message. Now, what has transpired from that? Uh, that's out there in the world, but we know here is the original for people to prove and look at. And those that need to make the decision, the, the decision makers, they can come back and see and say, well, this is the real deal. This is what it was. This is what it was meant to be before it was mis manipulated or misused. So uh, the blockchain part of that is really an added layer and a much needed layer. But again, we'll go back to the, the trust of that. And we need to have the things in place like we're talking about that people know it's authentic and it's genuine. So that's where uh, I think this, this blockchain can play a big part into some of these folks that are delving off into it without folks wanting to make a quick buck on AI and throw something out there that looks really pretty and say, oh, I'm doing this, this, and this, and then it, it fails. But we want to have it for the longevity because we see how quickly this is changing. Even since our last uh, SIG meeting, Brett, this, this has already changed so much. And so many articles have come out with uh, talking about what people are creating. People are giving you uh, shock and awe and bells and whistles and look at how I'm generating- And, and lawsuits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so it's 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 to have this kind of discussion that we're having on, on this hyperledger uh meeting is it's critical for us to have. And I'm I'm looking forward for you to share this and you and Randy to share this because we need to be the proactive people along with the folks that we've talked about, the C2PA are just vital, the CAI vital for us to do this. And we're glad to be a part of it and to share with folks and we want to help. We really do, and we want people to realize that their content has a value because we know the large language models will, <laughs> will eat them up, is what Karen likes to say, and they will utilize it. So we want to help protect people, all right? The As Orson was saying, the the, uh, the content has a value, and, and one of the main reasons, when, well, when I went to uh, Stanford to the uh, C2PA meeting in, in December, uh, one of the things that was talked about is how uh, they've tried training uh, AI models with artificially generated data. And what they find out is that after about five training cycles, and Ethan, I'm coming to you next. Um, <sighs> Ethan is a senior data scientist at Walmart in his other life. Um, but after a fi about five uh, training cycles, the models start to collapse in on themselves. They actually destroy themselves. They don't work anymore. It tears it up. So you have to, it has a need for human generated data. And as Orson said, you know, one of our biggest goals is to have an impact on poverty 
by helping people get paid for their training data. Ethan, you want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful point. Um, so when we are looking at contrastive learning and and really trying to, it, I'll back up a little bit. When we are looking to fine tune and add layers to a model, um, you generally are either fully retraining a model or you are adding you know, more layers to it um, and, and keeping the original as it was. And with the problem with uh, doing highly uh, generative contrastive learning and fine tuning methods is exactly what Karen said is um, the model begins to learn things that are not exactly human nature. You know, there is a push and pull of the patterns that that we see. Um, and that's why you see if there is a, uh, a model out there that let's say is trained using chat GPT data, it's generally a smaller parameter model and uh, meaning, you know, still 7 billion parameters, but not on the scale of hundreds of billions, uh, the trillions of parameters. What's a parameter, Ethan? Um, tell, tell them what a parameter yeah, is. Yeah, that is, you can think of it as a neuron um, in your brain. You know, each parameter would be like a neuron uh, in your in your brain. Um, and basically what it learns is uh, the, co the connection between two things. So the, you know, and forecasting the connection between um, the humidity and it raining, you know, something like that. It, it builds up that relationship and it's like over cycles of training, it says, hey, this is actually a really important piece of information in this given scenario. So we'll activate this neuron so that the rest of the network can, can, um, can react cor in, 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 in correspondence. Um, and so when we're looking at something that is purely generated by AI, really all it's learning is relationships between different things. And our AI isn't exactly human. So of course it's going to start to learn that patterns that are not human in nature. Um, and especially the more parameters you have, the more those connections uh, begin to create a huge network effect of, wow, this thing is wildly off now because um, it's learning a lot. You know, there's so many different relationships that are happening. It's, it's learning both human and AI, you know, basically. And that was um, kind of what we had in blockchain tethered AI in my book. Right. right? That was the, mm -hmm. yep, the, exactly. the premise, and that's the thing that made me first think of it. As we were, we were uh, building AI for people who are blind and visually impaired, and so we wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that I, I had asked the question of IBM senior engineers. This was eight years ago, and I said, "Well, how do you know that the data hasn't been spoofed?" And you know, if you're giving mm -hmm. this to someone who's blind and visually impaired, and you're using training data, how do you know that that data hasn't been spoofed? And they huddled together. This was on a big stage at the Think Conference. They huddled together and they came back and they said, if you think that's bad, think about the algorithms. Yep. And I was like, holy moly. So there's all yeah. kinds of uses for blockchain all the way down into the guts of these systems to make sure that they're not an opaque box, that they are trackable mm -hmm. and traceable, that we can trust it, even though we can't see into it. Um, you know, uh, the with the uh, consumer facing trust logos that are then can be dug into. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, these things are all really, really important. So, you know, even, you know, how has the system been trained? That's, you know, really, really good use for blockchain. And then when you tie it back to the things that Orson's been talking about, making sure entertainers get paid for the use of their likeness, 
you know, now you can see it's all one big circle. So it's really important that standards like C2PA be able to talk to things like uh, machine learning uh, operations systems that have then also posted uh, their usage of the training data onto blockchain and, and record of whether or not that person has been paid can also be tied in. Karen, can I ask a question of you and uh, Ethan and Orson? Um, our item number four, which you just identified as being that's training data that's used to produce music, film, TV, video, script, et cetera, should it be protected and regulated and licensed. Is there the, op and, you know, uh, blockchain aside, because blockchain obviously has some value in just the, 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 the tracking of that training data. But in your guys' opinion, should it be licensed? Could you license some training data? Could you uh, regulate that training data? Could you find a way? And blockchain would be the proof of what that training data is to actually monetize that training data using the blockchain. And then I'm going to go one step further and leave mm -hmm. it open because we're down to seven minutes. Using the blockchain, a permissioned private blockchain, then leapfrogging over to a public blockchain and having the owners of that protected and licensed training data paid via some type of digital currency that's on a public blockchain like Ethereum. So instantaneous of that blockchain mm -hmm. or, or something recognizing that training data which was licensed to somebody being used, it could be monetized. Go ahead. Whoop, there it is. Yeah. Orson, do you think that's too hot to handle? <laughs> that's, too, that's too hot to handle right now. <laughs> Tell them why I said those things. Well, well uh, whoop, there it is. Uh, Al Bell that was mentioned that I was the chief operating officer for is the legendary Al Bell. He uh, had, uh, he owns the Whoop, there it is. And he also was one of the writers of uh, Too Hot to Handle. So that's why she said that. <laughs> But uh, you're, you're just blazing, Brett. I'm telling you, you're blazing. I, I saw, I saw Ethan was just uh, he he is so excited. I, I Ethan, the I think you need to go ahead and answer that. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, 100. percent You know, that's, um, that is, I think, the ideal for our interaction and creating an economy around AI. Um, and it's really a circular economy. We're, we're building a stronger relationship with AI. AI is building a stronger relationship with us. Um, we don't want AI to train AI. We want to be the ones that both benefit economically from, from that process, but are also, we're, we're building relationships, you know, and as weird as that is, that is the, the, the paradigm shift that is happening, you know, um, people think of these massive models as almost like a compression of reality. You know, they're, they have done so well at learning everything that they can generally understand most things. Um, and we want to be the ones in control of that. We don't want them to come up with their own representation of reality, you know? Um, and so I really think that there is a circular effect there that we can tap into, like you said, Brett, where we are getting compensated for helping train these models, but we're also, in, in effect, also building a stronger relationship with, with the AI systems that we're, that we're training with our data. So I think you uh, that, totally that, hit the nail on the head there. That's, yeah, that's the... That's an outstanding answer, Orson and uh, Ethan. Um, you guys get it. I mean, I think we all get it, Karen. That everybody here gets just what we have to do to make sure that AI doesn't overwhelm the entertainment industry in all in all respects. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And there's go ahead, Orson. Go ahead. Well, well Brent, I, I went. But the article came out last week that. Uh, OpenAI put out the Sora model uh, of that creating image creator generator, and it's 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 mind blowing. <laughs> Some of the 
the details of that, I was really stunned. I had to really look to make sure I didn't see this puppy rolling in the snow that, you know, it looks so real. And the, and the, the spaceman and all these different things. But what was very interesting was an article that came out with Tyler Perry and uh, that Tyler Perry was uh, was about to or in the plans of expanding his studio and production facilities. And he has put it on pause because of what he has seen this application do. And he, it, it's making a lot of business people, moguls, filmmakers reconsider some of the things that they do for the large expenditures of putting in a sound stage, production studios, and all these different things. But it's something for us to think about because there's still uses for the content creators to yeah. do it the right way. And that, I just wanted to mention that uh, for those that didn't know, but it's made a lot of people think of what, what's coming with uh, the AI uh, and, and some of the things that are happening. My, my response to that, I, and I know exactly the article that you were referring to and I, uh, I I did I think I did something on LinkedIn about it but in my response it was something like uh, I am very familiar with I can't believe it's not butter butter which isn't butter and I know instinctively when I'm eating I can't believe it's not butter butter and I think that the same is going to apply when I'm watching an AI generated video or something deep fake whatever that it's a I believe I, I can believe it's not butter butter type of thing so it's you know instinctively no i mean some people aren't and i think the majority of the population is not going to be arson to your point absolutely it's worrying that uh, that uh, tyler perry has uh, scaled back his plans to allow content creation by humans uh and 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 step aside and let the content creation by robots take take place so so many things on our on our on our agenda talking about should they declare it you know should you have a big sign at the start of a movie saying this is all ai generated and then half the audience leaves i'm not interested <laughs> in you know i can't believe it's not butter butter i'm interested in real butter right like real, anyway real that's butter. my that's right. well, I'll, I'll, outstanding I'll, point go ahead Karen. i just will say that when my my little boy was little uh, there was Blues Clues live at the Palace Theater. Okay, he was a big Blues Clues fan. You know who Blues Clues is with Steve. And let's find our first clue is a thing for toddlers. And uh, he was huge, huge Blues Clues fan. He was probably four years old. And so I took him to the Palace Theater to see in Cleveland, Ohio, to see Blues Clues. And we had great seats. And it wasn't Steve. It was somebody else. And I could hear all the other kids talking about it. That's not Steve. That's not <laughs> Steve. My little boy didn't care that that wasn't Steve. He just tuned them all out and he did not care that that was not Steve. And he enjoyed himself to the maximum. So, you know, there is a place for, he knew that wasn't Steve because he could hear uh, everybody yeah. saying it, but he still wanted to be entertained. Listen, uh, it's one o'clock, <laughs> one o one, and, and I don't mean to shut this down because we could probably go for another hour. But I want to, uh, I want to thank you, Karen and Orson and Ethan, you guys and Randy. Thank you for paying attention and what's going on and filling in those. Uh, I appreciate everything from you guys, and we'll see you next time. Look for the recording. Thank you so much. We'll be thank in touch. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you, Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brett. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.